All right, so welcome to lesson seven, where we look at proteins and protein structures. We're gonna to continue to build off of, as I said, uh, the idea of carbs and lipids, and looking at how functional groups help to perform a very specific role with these macromolecules and how they are going to kind of drive how that macromolecule behaves. So when we look at proteins, it's very important to recognize that these polymers uh, are made from amino acids. So with regards to the polymers of proteins, uh, they're going to be considering, we're going to be considering how they work in terms of all of those amino acids coming together to form that protein. And, and so we're thinking of amino acids as the component of a polymer. So when we look at that amino acid as a polymer, we can start to look at it as a protein. Oops. We can start to look at it as a protein, and then we can determine some specific functions as a result of those polymers and those smaller micro polymers or micro molecules. So what are uh, the important aspects of proteins? Well, they are gonna, gonna provide a lot of structural uh, basis for all living cellular organisms in some way, shape or form. Uh, they help to build tissues, they help to build tissue systems and then organs. And as you recall from grade 11 biology, it kind of scales up. Uh, they help with regards to enzymes. Uh, they make up enzymes and those enzymes help catalyze reactions that are going to happen. We'll talk about that more in lesson eight. Uh, that will be very important for your assignment for this unit. They help make up cell membrane proteins uh, that help with transport. And I, I'm going to talk a little bit about it today, but I'm really going to talk a lot about it uh, in the coming days where we look at active and passive transport. And, and again, that connects back to that phospholipid bilayer. Uh, it keeps water out and it keeps water in the cell. Uh, but how do we get things into and out of the cell? These cell membrane proteins are, are, are crucial, absolutely crucial to that transport of things in and out of the cell. So what is an amino acid? Well, like I said, in that recall aspect above, the polymers are gonna be composed of amino acid monomers, and they contain that amino group that we looked at. It's gonna be an NH2 or an NH3. They also contain a carboxyl group, that COOH, uh, and also they contain a hydrogen uh, atom bound to a central carbon atom. And this is the general structure of an amino acid. Uh, so it's very important that we recognize that that general state of an amino acid, the R group is going to be variable. It's not going to be something consistent. It can be multiple, multiple different things depending on what type of function that that protein needs to carry out. So that fourth bond surrounding the, the central atom is, like I said, it's going to be variable. Uh, it's that side group that will help designate with the letter R. Uh, there's a total of 20 possible side groups. Uh, and therefore that means there are 20 unique amino acids. And with those 20 unique amino acids, it helps to build all of the things that we see uh, in all life, really and truly, um, with regards to those structures. So it's one of possible 20, uh, and I'm not obviously not gonna have you memorize all of them uh, because that will be for your experience in university as I had to do so as well when I did my biology undergraduate degree. Uh, and in first year bio and in cellular biology, when you have to memorize every single one of those 20 amino acids and how they behave and what their functional groups are, uh, think of me and feel whatever feeling you wish to feel in a couple of years time when that time comes. So uh, again, right, it, the key thing here that you have to realize is that while the R group varies, it also leads to some variable with regards to how it behaves. So when we look at that general amino acid structure that I'm currently highlighting, the R group that uh, is highlighted in a, a lighter orange above really determines how that protein or how that amino acid is gonna behave. So when you look at the R group in that first one where that tryptophan, uh, which is also the thing that makes you sleepy in meat. Uh, so if you have too much meat, tryptophan is a thing that contributes to your tiredness. Uh, that R group is hydrophobic and it is nonpolar as a result of it. And then we have some hydrophilic R groups that uh, also can be polar uncharged, charged acidic, and charged basic. So really that R group really determines how that amino acid behaves and then how that amino acid behaves as it's making a chain of, uh, within that protein dictates how that protein is going to behave. And well, there's plenty of time for us to discuss how that is, but really and truly that's the underpinning aspect of life as a whole. Those chains, that polymer of, of protein, as those amino acids are attached to that polymer, depending on the type of amino acid that is attached, it can lead to that protein structure changing and that protein function changing. And, and we'll talk more about that as we move forward. 
So when we talk about peptide bonds, we're talking about how the overarching uh, polymer is created. So that peptide is that chain of amino acid monomers that are connected by peptide bonds. Those polypeptides are basically peptides that have 50, uh, more than 50 amino acids. So when we think about how large these amino acids and these proteins can get, we really have to consider how the uh, process of connecting those monomers to make a polymer works. So again, just like what we learned in our carbohydrates in terms of our dehydration synthesis reaction uh, to join those amino acids, just how we looked at it in terms of those fats and how we add those glycerols uh, together to form that fatty acid. Same thing comes with regards to peptides, right? Uh, it's the amino acid needs to form a, a water molecule through dehydration to link those two amino acids together to form that polypeptide. Uh, so it's the same amino acid or same in each amino acid that forms the peptide background or that backbone, it's gonna be the same, okay? It's that functional group that varies that I talked about earlier. And, and so the amino acids are joined in that peptide backbone that we looked at earlier. That's the thing I highlighted here. Oops, I'll change my color real quick. Uh, the thing I highlighted here, that's gonna form that backbone for that polypeptide. Always, 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 always. So as you see, I've highlighted that uh, hydroxyl group in the hydrogen. Uh, when we go through that dehydration process, those R side groups are gonna be pointed out and that peptide bond is gonna be between that hydroxyl group as well, or sorry, between that uh, carboxyl group and that nitrogen and that peptide, yeah, that peptide bond between that carbon and that amino acid of N. So the key thing here that's, that's most important to kind of understand and realize is that uh, no matter which amino acids are joined together, uh, it can be any one of those 20 that I, I discussed a little bit earlier. Any one of those 20 can be attached onto that polypeptide uh, backbone, but always, always that, that base backbone will be made up out of the, the general amino acid chemical structure. Uh, so when we look at protein structure, I kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier in terms of how different things fold and how different things create that new structure. So we're gonna look at it in terms of primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. Uh, so when we talk about all of those things, it's important to recognize some of the aspects. So the primary structure, that level of structure, that first level of structure is gonna be connected by peptide bonds. So all of those peptide bonds, those polypeptides that have come together to form that polymer of amino acids that I have come together um, they form what's called a primary structure. Uh, in this case, you don't really see too much additional structure. It's just a chain of amino acids that have come together. Uh, so it's bonds on a string, essentially. The sequence of amino acids are joined together by peptide bonds. Uh, it's very important that you recognize we have what's called a C-terminus and an N-terminus. Uh, the C-terminus referring to that open carbon molecule or that open carbon atom that's able to uh, accept more amino acids onto it just likewise with that N-terminus. In order to attach those peptides together, a C-terminus and an N-terminus have to come together, okay? That, that's a, it's a crucial component of uh, polypeptide formation. C and N-terminus, they need to be things that, those are the two things that need to be joined together, whether it's for uh, two polypeptides coming together or one amino acid attaching to another amino acid or what have you. That C-terminus and N-terminus need to be the things that are connected to each other. When we think about secondary structure, when we think about secondary structure, or the second degree, we're looking at how these uh, amino acid chains start to form shape. So hydrogen bonding is gonna happen between the oxygen, nitrogen, and, and uh, hydrogen atoms of that peptide backbone, that primary structure. It's gonna start to interact with each other. And those interactions can be quite strong as a result of hydrogen bonding. Uh, and it's gonna form some general structures that we start to see come up often in biology. I talked a little bit about that with regards to carbohydrates and a little bit about that with regards to proteins now, that beta pleated sheet that fiber is made up out of versus that alpha helix uh, that DNA tends to take on that structure. Uh, so the key thing here to recognize is that secondary structure, and I'll start to highlight some stuff with regards to why it's important. That secondary structure happens as a result of hydrogen bonding and those interactions are strong attraction. So it's very, very difficult to break this secondary structure. Okay, 
usually heat is required. And, and I'll talk more about some specific examples uh, because the one excellent example that I learned when I was your age, and, and I think it still holds true today, uh, anytime you cook eggs is a perfect example of how protein structure changes so drastically as a result of heat that it, it's not something that you can uh, undo per se. Okay, so that tertiary structure, that third degree, uh, this is where we start to look at some uh, big things start to form as a result of that. So what happens here is the hydrogen bonds between those polar ends, uh, they kind of start to connect and, and, and they start to form even larger 3D structures, if you will. Uh, so at the end of the day, when we talk about that aspect of structure of a protein, uh, we're talking about this tertiary structure and the hydrogen bonds between those polar ends and those polar sides. Uh, those hydrophobic aspects of amino acids will orient themselves towards the inside. The hydrophilic aspects will orient themselves outward, just like we talked about with regards to that poly, um, or sorry, that phospholipid chain. The hydrophobic parts will always in orient in towards the interior, hydrophilic orient towards the outside or the, uh, the exterior. And the reason being is that when you think about where proteins are made, as we learn through uh, molecular genetics, they're made inside the cell, which is a predominantly water-based uh, cytoplasm. So you really wanna protect those hydrophobic parts uh, by folding them inward. So, and that's done by that hydrogen bonding. Uh, so the key thing here to realize is that that backbone has now formed that beta pleated sheet or that alpha helix. And then those alpha helix hydrogen bonds are now gonna start to even more Hydrogen, there's going to be even more hydrogen bonds that go on that will try to move those hydrophobic places away from water and the hydrophilic places towards water. So those forms that are, are going to be coming as a result of those ionic side groups, as a result of that polar uh, difference in different functional or the R groups, and all of that comes into play to make that tertiary structure. So it's going to be, and I, I have here, it's a combination of helices and sheets based on R groups. And then lastly, we have the quaternary structure. Um, the key thing here is that that fourth degree of folding, this is the largest uh, macro scale with which that we see proteins form shapes and structures. Uh, they then come together to form tissues or cells as a whole, which then yield itself a different um, uh, function as a result of that. So when we think about what this means, uh, a good example is hemoglobin as a protein as a whole its function to carry oxygen to and from uh, different parts of your body. Uh, it's responsible uh, for making sure we all stay alive, for lack of a better word. The heme protein is a larger component of uh, several different proteins that come together. So we have what's called a beta globulin polypeptide, another beta globulin, uh, globulin poly polypeptide, as well as alpha globulin uh, polypeptides. And all of those different tertiary, secondary, and primary folded proteins come together to form one hemoglobin uh, protein. So if you wanna look at it at this way, it's, it's the formation of a protein structure or pro protein complex as a result of many different amino acid polypeptide chains coming together. And so we look at that in terms of, oops, one second, that's too much information. I don't want to all that. We look at that in terms of all of the amino acids with a specific subgroup those subgroups now are going to start to interact with other amino acids and form even more subgroups. So it's not just one polypeptide anymore, it's multiple polypeptides working together. Uh, we call this prosthetic group or the heme, for example. It's a non-protein component because it's iron-based and doesn't have the specific uh, definition that fits a protein, uh, but it helps the protein as a whole, that hemoglobin total protein, all of those different polypeptides and the heme, they all help that hemoglobin function. So this is a lot of information with regards to primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures, uh, but they all work in conjuncture to help with uh, protein shape and protein function. So the last thing I want to talk about here with regards to proteins and uh, the importance of those protein shapes, uh, the sequence of amino acids in that polypeptide determines its shape, uh, and as a result of that sequence and shape, it de therefore determines the function. Uh, because again, as you recall, that primary shape, that primary strand, um, the, the key thing here is that we need to understand that that primary shape then takes on a secondary shape as a result of the functional groups and the, and the sorry, the R groups. Then that secondary shape takes on a tertiary state as a result of the uh, hydrophobic, hydrophilic parts that those R groups uh, possess. 
And then that quaternary structure, that quaternary shape takes place as a result of all primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, shapes coming together to form that quaternary shape. Uh, that denaturing aspect that I was talking about, it's a change in the environment that alters the protein shape. Temperature, pH, all of those things can impact how that protein changes. Uh, at the end of the day, the most important thing you need to realize here is that once that change happens, the protein can't go back to the shape that it was. That's why, um, quite frankly, when, when human beings, uh, uh, human beings cells that die, the, that's uh, one way that happens is that the proteins denature and they change shape. And then as a result of that, those cells can no longer go back to function the way that they function. Okay, folks, so that's it with regards to the lesson as a whole. Um, I'm glad that we finished it quite quickly because there is a lot to digest. And so I want to give you the opportunity to ask questions, okay? So I see a lot of questions being asked in the chat. Uh, I'll just quickly scroll through. Does a sentence that starts with two cysteine belong to tertiary or quaternary? Where is the two cysteine one? Yeah, the two cysteine is the disulfate bridge. So I'll separate that here. Uh, da -da. There, is that, does that help? That's how we separate it. I'm glad I didn't stop recording yet. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm still recording, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that uh, for those people who are watching it later, they know where it's separate. So I'll end the recording here and, and I'll answer all sorts of questions.